everyone and welcome. This is Transmission for the Tuba, an argument and recital. My name is Ben. I'm a doctorate or a candidate for a doctorate in musical arts here at the U. And what I'd like to do is I would like to start with a little bit of background on the history of the tuba and the history of its soloistic repertoire to give you an idea of the unique place it has, not only as a soloistic instrument and also as an ensemble instrument and the place of its solo repertoire. So the tuba began life as um, a patent in 1835 by the Prussian instrument maker Wilhelm Wieprecht. And for about the next 60 years, the tuba was vying as um, to be part of the symphonic and operatic orchestra and the wind band with instruments like the serpent and the ophicleide. And as it was trying to gain ascendancy in these ensembles, its soloistic repertoire was also, I should say, slow in developing. The first documented case of a solo repertoire for the tuba in the United States is a collection of six solo songs in 1881 by the arranger Harry Prendeville. They were called Six Solo Songs for E-flat bass. And the one piece that has remained constant since then was a piece called Rocked in the Cradle of the Deep. I'm sure the pun was fully intended that this was definitely a deep sound, and of course, <laughs> other pieces followed soon suit. Uh, the first solo for tuba and wind band in 1896 by Jay Ringleben called The Storm King. And then in the last decade of the 19th century, in the few first decades of the 20th century, you had pieces similarly named. Uh, Solo Pomposo, Emmett's Lullaby, Beelzebub, uh, pieces on which, of course, the names imply just a little bit of farce. There's a little bit of silliness. The tuba is not supposed to be taken very seriously. So, in its first hundred years, from about 1835 to about 1935, while other instruments have developed these uh, story in standardized repertoires. You can see Mr. List here in one of his piano recitals about the time the tuba was being patented in the 1840s. Uh, you get a sense from some of these tuba solos that the only thing a tuba player could counter something like the Dvorak cello concerto or a Brahms violin concerto with was something like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was a lot. I mean, that, that is the sense that one gets that tuba. Um, for all of its design improvements over its first hundred years was still in many ways a silly and farcical instrument. And what better way to demonstrate that than of course the fact that there was not very much at all of a solo repertoire. But all of that started to change in about 1937. Uh, 1937, William J. Bell, first professor of tuba at Indiana University in Bloomington, uh, came out with this transcription, uh, Air and Beret by Bach. See, what he did was he took a chorale setting of Bach's Cum Suserto, or Cum Sweet Death, and also a beret, a dance from his second sonata, second sonata for violin. And what he did was he repackaged them as the air, the chorale, and the beret, or the sonata portion of that. And this is significant not only because it's now one of the oldest continuously played transcriptions for the tuba, but it's significant because you have a major figure in the history of the tuba, William Bell, not only that professor at Indiana University, but also one of the premier performers in some of the professional wind bands of that time, arranging a piece by a true master composer, Bach, the great master of the chorale setting and of counterpoint from the 18th century. So now you start to get a little bit of class, a little bit of sophistication in the tuba's solo repertoire. But this was only a harbinger of things to come because it was not until Dr. Bell's finest student, a man by the name of Harvey Phillips, came onto the scene that things started really changing. In 1950, Harvey Phillips had already completed some studies with Dr. Bell and already had done a, a, almost a career's worth of music in the service. And in 1950, he moved to New York to freelance as a musician and also enrolled for studies at the Juilliard School. And in his autobiography, he relates a wonderful story regarding this, the topic of the solo repertoire and the idea of transcription for the tuba. 
And what he relates is that when he got to his practice room, he could only practice for about 30 minutes because the solos he had, of course, were so uninteresting. He didn't want to practice rocked in the cradle in the deep or asleep in the deep uh, for a long time because there wasn't much of interest to him. So, fearing he would lose more motivation, he went to seek the help of his theory professor at the time, a man by the name of Vincent Persichetti. Vincent Persichetti, since that time, has since and rightly been regarded as one of America's finest modernist composers. At this time, he was teaching Harvey uh, theory at Juilliard. Well, one day, as this story relates, or as uh, Dr. Phillips relates this story, he went into Dr. Persichetti's office and basically vented his frustration about how there was nothing soloistic for the tuba to play. And after hearing his concerns, Dr. Persichetti came back with this. Harvey, I have two things I want to say to you. First, I want you to know that all the music ever written belongs to you as much as any other musician. I am a composer, and I speak for composers who cannot speak for themselves. I speak for Bach, Handel, Mozart, Scarlatti, and others. They want you to play their music. They want you to play it well, in the right style, and with serious purpose. So if you hear something you want to play on the tuba, take it. Play it. It belongs to you. And the second thing he said to Harvey Phillips at that time was, if you want to do something about the lack of original repertoire for the tuba, you have to do it yourself. And that's exactly what he did in the second half of the 20th century. And especially if you consult the Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians under Harvey Phillips, you'll say that he's called the Doyan of the tuba. Now the pretentious title aside, that's exactly what he was. He was the driving force behind many of the commissions that we see for the tuba in the second half of the 20th century, as well as perhaps one of the finest tuba players ever, and the successor to William Bell as professor of tuba euphonium at Indiana University. But it's this first half, this remark about transcribing music that Persichetti said to Mr. Phillips that I'm concerned with. And I'll take this as justification enough, as a manifesto, a manifesto enough for us as tuba players to take music and transcribe it. Not only because it, better, our, it betters ourselves as musicians and as musical historians, but also because it pays homage to the great master composers of older times. No matter what the medium, even if the medium is tuba, it is our responsibility as musicians to make sure that this music keeps being played. Now also in these remarks, there are two challenges, two conditions that Dr. Persichetti has laid out in evaluating works for transcription. We must seek to play music in the right style and with serious purpose. And we also have to see to play it, uh, to make it belong to us, to make it our own. And that's the framework I'm going to be using with those two challenges, to play it rightly and to play it as if it belongs to the tuba in evaluating these works on this recital today. So, what I would first like to do is draw attention to the first piece, the handle piece. So the question, I'm glad there's a little light here now, um, how is it that we play a piece like this seriously? How do we play it with the right style? The first piece, if you refer to your program, being Ombro My Fu from his opera, Circe. We first have to understand a little bit about where this came from, the time and place in which it was created. Uh, Ombro My Fu is a, an act one aria from his opera, from Handel, George Georg Friedrich Handel's opera, Circe, from 1738. It was performed only a few times at the King's Theater in London before it it was howled out. It was very innovative at its time for a matter I'll get to later. But it was one of the last of his operatic styles before he turned fully to writing English language oratorios on biblical themes. Um, but in this, Sursa, or Xerxes, the old ancient Persian king, um, is the title character. And even though it's a serious opera, he is not as tragic as the histories would relate of being defeated by the Greeks. This has nothing to do with that. And this, even though he acts with vengeance through much of the opera, he is finally vindicated in the end. 
And here, at the very beginning of the opera, we catch him in actually a really good mood. He's sitting under a plain tree somewhere in Persia, and he's singing an ode to how beautiful the shape is, the noble simplicity of something as, as simple but as helpful as shape. And after this, he sees his lover, Romilda, and he decides to ask her to marry him, and then the plot sort of thickens from then on. But in order to play this seriously, that's only the start, understanding where this came from. Then we have to understand that with Baroque music from a time like 1738, what you see on the page is not always what it actually seems. Musicians back then understood that the printed score was only a very beginning to what they actually had to do to do justice and play a piece. The reasons include mostly the fact that these pieces were not really meant for wide distribution or publication. The musicians that performed this piece had personal relationships with these composers, and so they knew a little bit of things about how to make that work. Um, especially with ornamentation. You will see a lot, there's a lot of expectation of Baroque music to ornament these pieces. Now the good news is, this piece does not require a lot of ornamentation. This piece is actually very excellent for transcription to the tuba because it's kind of a primer. It's kind of an introduction into Baroque music. It's very short. It's, it's not a da capo aria. And it works very well because we're not expected to do a lot. And the reason we don't have to ornament, the reason there's not a lot of expectation is twofold. If you look at the piano part there, the bottom two stays, you'll see that it accompanies the melody basically note by note, or as we might say, homophonically. The only reason is what it's really doing, it's not adding anything of melodic interest, but what it's doing is supporting the voice note by note so that the melodic line of the voice is heard and so that um, the clarity of the text is always first and foremost. The second reason is, as I just said, this is not a da capo aria. Da capo aria being a three-part aria where the original material returns and you would be expected to highly ornament that second time that the original material comes back. This is simply, this is an ode to the simple beauty of the shade of a plane tree and I think we should play it like that. So what are some other ways in which we can make this belong to ourselves as tuba players? Well, one thing we have to understand is what this piece is going to demand of us. Um, this piece was premiered by a, mezzo, a male mezzo-soprano, a castrato singer, named Gaetano Caffarelli in the original 1738 production. Caffarelli is one of the finest, finest singers of the 18th century. But because he was a constrato, what that made him, of course, was that made him physically um, kind of a phenomenon. He had a, an abnormally expanded lung capacity because of the fact that his rib cage, the bones in his rib cage, had much more elasticity. And that was, of course, due to the delay of puberty uh, based on that surgery that he had. So a singer like him would have expected to sing this aria with very, very few breaths. This melody on its own, if you can see, just glides. It just, it's very, very slender and it's very, very stylish. But a singer like that could have done this and made very, very few phrase marks and have made it sound even more beautiful. So the challenge to the tuba player, just like the challenge to a female mezzo soprano or a male countertenor today, is to make this as seamless as possible. We have to understand that this is the challenge for this piece, that this piece exercises the tuba's high range, <clears throat> especially because the key of this piece, F minor, in the original vocal score, which is, this is the closest original vocal score, is perfect for us to take this down and transpose it two octaves. And thus, this makes it an excellent, excellent recital piece to either open or put somewhere in the middle to have it cleanse, basically, to have a nice change of pace. And right there, one bit of ornamentation we will use, you see that highlight right there, that's in cadence, that's the one thing that we do have to use. We're not entirely off the hook with ornaments, we are expected to, oh, that's orange. Okay, it's from mine, it's yellow on the computer. Um, that's where you would put in, we will put in all these cadences, a little bit of a trill. That was a way in the 18th century to actually add not only coloration to the notes, but also lots of harmonic and, and sort of dissonance interest. It's sort of a, an extra little bit of tension before the release of the tonic. So, now, 
I hope you will enjoy Mrs. Handel's Lundgren Leifu from his opera Xerxes. The new mode, the new fashion, uh, was the Enlightenment. 
And the Enlightenment, of course, was a period of time in the middle of the 18th century when writers, philosophers, and yes, even musicians mused on what it was uh, that man's real purpose was in a very secular way. Uh, what is, what are his rights as an individual? What are his claims to freedom? What are his claims to being a free-thinking person? A later historian, a man by the name of J.Y. Allenbrook, would later say that the Enlightenment, especially as it pertains to music, is moving people through representations of their own humanity. And how were people moved at this time? The style in which they were moved, in Enlightenment terms, was the gallant. And what is the gallant? Well, the French satirist and philosopher Voltaire claimed that the gallant being gallant in general, means seeking to please. This was among the most idealistic, um, idealistic movements in all of the Enlightenment period. The gallant really was about trying to unify all men and trying to not be displeasing in any one way. And the gallant was a movement in music in which now all of the learning, all of the operatic and symphonic styles that came before were now given a great polish, a nice finish. So what you would see in this music, in the Gallant period, are periodic phrases, consistent phrases, phrases of eight bars, of 12 bars to modulate, of 16 bars. And you would see very simple, very structured, very clean structures of modulation from tonic to dominant, and then back in the return to tonic. And this was not only because this was the convention of earlier practices like the Capo Aria, but it was also, as Joseph Haydn would say of the symphony, so a listener could leave with something memorable in his heart. These composers were very idealistic, they were very much universalist, and they thought people could be moved anywhere in the world by music that was uplifting constantly. And so what you hear in the music of Mozart is music that does, like Voltaire says, aim to please. It is almost always consonant, it is full of wit, it is full of elegance and charm. Now, this very much describes what happened with the bassoon concerto in 1774. It is a piece that displays all of those things. It is a piece that, that hopefully will, that you can sense even will please everyone. And that is the seriousness of purpose that we must play it with. We must seek to always be graceful, to always be elegant, and to never be too disproportionate in anything that we do in the piece. We cannot be too excessive in articulation, too excessive in style, too excessive in our dynamics. We must seek to please, we must seek to be graceful in all things. Now, as far as making this piece our own, because it was written for the bassoon, it is in bass clef, and we can read it in concert pitch as is. Unfortunately, if taken in the bassoon's octave, um, some of the some of the low inner or some of most of the piece is written a little bit too high for what the tuba player can actually do and still remain comfortable. So if we tried to do that then, it would be hard for us to be pleasing because we would be confused and probably very tired. So the solution that I have come up with is I am playing it now an octave below, but not on the F tuba, but on the C tuba, for which that octave is much more characteristic. And that leads us to just a few problems. There are spots in the score where Mozart is very, very witty. He wants to point out that the bassoon is capable of playing some very low notes, and he wants people to it, not, not be displeased, but to be a little bit amused by that. And one such is right here, that note with the line under it, and to do it mark. That is, that is B flat 2. B flat 2 is low enough, but if I was to take everything down one octave, that would be B flat 1, and B flat 1 is so low as to be actually more felt than actually heard. So, even though I'm compromising a little bit of the wit of Mozart, I'm keeping the tasteful elegance of Mozart intact by actually playing that up in its original octave as a B flat two. And those are some of the editorial changes I think we need to consider, not only to make it more comfortable ourselves, but also more listenable to the audience. And that would be remaining true to what Mozart had to say and what Mozart actually wanted. So, with that, this 
is the first movement of Mozart's concerto for bassoon and orchestra K91, K191 in B flat. Excuse me a second. Thank you. 
For some time now, I've been very busy. It's been my most fruitful year, 1849. It seemed as if the outer storms compel people to turn inward. The outer storms that he's referring to are the revolts that sprouted all over Europe, but especially in Dresden, in the kingdom of Saxony, what is now Germany, in 1848, that continued on into 1849. Schumann himself was a Republican. That is, he longed for democratic reform and more equal opportunity for the people that lived in Saxony. But the king and his forces eventually squashed the Landtag, or the government of the people. Schumann fled, but he was so disgusted with the behavior of the aristocrats that he was taking refuge with, and uh, the behavior of the king that quashed this rebellion, that his republican sentiment was even more stirred. And he retreated even more into himself, as you see with what he wrote in writing his music in this, his very productive year of 1849. He finally had some stability after years of instability in making money in the city of Dresden, was happily married, and for a few more years would continue as one of Germany's finest, finest composers. Um, but what we have to do in looking at the next piece, which is the third romance, the moderato from the three romances he wrote for oboe and piano, exactly what is it he's trying to represent? Because in the Romantic era, instead of looking outward and trying to unify people, composers instead looked inward and tried to just express exactly what they were feeling, their subjectivity put down into song, put into musical verse things of that nature. What exactly was it that Schumann was trying to get after in pieces like this Three Romances? We have to understand a little bit about Schumann. Schumann, as a writer and critic for the Neue Zeitschrift for Music, his own musical publication uh, in German, would often represent his opinions of what other composers were writing, not as his own opinion, I thought this, I thought that, but he would represent them rather as a dialogue between characters that he had invented with stock names like Florestan or odd names like a fourth century pope named Eusebius. And instead of having one opinion, he would express what he was thinking through the dialogues of these characters. And what they really represented were irreconcilable and diverse opinions he held within himself on the views of this music. And when we look at, when you listen to the three romances for oboe and piano, ambiguity is exactly what you see. First, or I'm sorry, here. Uh, the first ambiguity that is really called attention to is rhythmical ambiguity, where everything in Mozart, and even the handle before him, everything flowed seamlessly and very evenly. In the Schumann, there are stops and starts. The rhythm pushes and it pulls. It expands and it contracts. In fact, for a little demonstration of what that is, I'm going to play just the opening lines of it, just so we can see how much music has changed in those 75 years from the time of the young Mozart to the fully matured Robert Schumann. <laughs> Third above that, a minor third above that in C major. 
know what's going on with that. In the day of Mozart, in the days of Handel, you modulated only to five and back to one, and that was it. But by the time of this, it was considered much more stylish and much more subjective, much more expressive, much more thus individualistic to modulate by thirds to C major. But we still have cadences in A minor, and we still have more cadences in C major. In fact, the second section of the piece is all in C major, even though it's a completely different character. And then at the end of the piece, as I hope you're going to pay attention to, we actually end in A major. But we're only in A major for a few bars. It's not really right to say that the piece is in A major. So what do we expect? What's the resolution of all this? Is the piece, we know that the Mozart was in F, or in B flat, I'm sorry. We know that the Handel was in F. We all had all that gloriously affirmed at the end of all those pieces. But this piece, what are we to think of it? What are we to think of all these stops and starts? What are we to think of the fact that the key is never really as it seems, and it never ends that way? Well, I think that Mr. Schumann actually wanted us to struggle with that, as artists and listeners, to understand that these were the ambiguities and the variations within himself that he was actually mapping out onto music. And that's a key to playing this with the right style and the right intent. And the other half, how do we make this belong to us as tuba players? Thankfully, this is one of the more transcribed works in his output as a composer. And the way it's written in C, or A major, or A minor, or whatever it is, for O, it actually works very well for the dark and round sound of the C tube on which I will play it transposed down exactly two octaves. This is a popular arrangement. I hope it continues to be popular because it's the beginnings of a new harmonic language, a new musical language of romanticism that we don't quite grapple with as they did in the 19th century. We play them as is, but it's really imperative that we have more of a deeper thought to how this goes. So this is, actually this is a painting uh, Dresden by Moonlight, 1850. This is exactly how it would have looked if Schumann might have been ready, writing this in the dark. This is Schumann's third moment from his three romances for oboe and piano. <laughs>
1912. And no less is happening at this time than uh, was happening before. Here. Um, in 1912, you have now the roots of a real rebellion, the roots of a real turning point in music history, the turn from the romantic ethos of individual expression uh, and the tonal idiom through the chromatic scale now to the modernist ethos with composers like Edgar Flores and Charles Ives in the United States, Igor Stravinsky in Paris, and Arnold Schoenberg in Vienna. Now you have people taking, people like them taking the fire of the romantic ethos, that fire of individual expression, of great, great feeling in music, but leaving behind the tonal idiom, that system of major and minor scale that, or major and minor mode that defined music from basically time immemorial, from in one way or another. And while this was happening in Europe and in the United States, in Russia, you had a young composer named Sergei Rachmaninoff, who actually, young, he was in his 30s at the time, interested in something completely different. He was inheriting his education from the Russian Romantic School. But he wasn't so much interested in exploring a new harmonic language as he was with fusing that harmonic language of the late Romantic ethos that he inherited from people like Rimsky, Korsakov, and Alexander Borodin to a sense of real place, a sense of Russian sentiment and nationalism. In 1912, he published his piece, 14 Romances, Opus 34. And the 14th of that romance is the final piece on the program, uh, Vocalise. Now, for 13 of these pieces, he devoted them, he dedicated them to major fig figures in Russian poetry. But for this, he dedicated it to, and here is the chain of supply, Russia's finest, oh, Russia's finest operatic soprano at that time, a woman named Antonina Nezhdanova. Miss Nezhdanova was hailed at the time for her excellent technique and her extraordinary ability to phrase. Actually, all of most of her singing, most of her singing in her Italianate songs, operas in the Italianate style, is available to everyone through Naxos and on YouTube. And when you listen to her voice and listen to her sing, that clarity and that perfect technique is readily apparent, but so is her sense of expression. Miss Nezhdanova, much like Rachmaninoff himself, was from a much more romantic ethos and a romantic school of singing and phrasing. You're not just going to hear something as it's written on a page, but embellished to the umpteenth degree with portamenti, with turns, with trills, with everything you can think of, so that the piece is equally an homage to someone like Rossini or Verdi as it is, actually her own artistry. And to her, to Miss Nezhdanova, Rachmaninoff dedicated this vocalise. A vocalise is a an exercise, a vocal exercise that is meant to be sung without words. And the genre had been around since about the mid 18th century, mostly for singers to perform with the pianist to exercise their sounds. But now in the, 19th, in the 20th century, as maybe one of the last fragments of the romantic idea of exploring new genre and covering new ground while being very expressive, vocalists have started to be arranged and meant for concert performance, in France especially. But in 1912, Rachmaninoff wrote one of the very first arranged for soprano and orchestra. And being meant for this singer, this is meant, this has a very flowing, flowing melodic line that is meant to show off her incredible technique. And it was also meant as an exercise in harmony. You can tell it's an exercise because it modulates very traditionally from E up to B, up or down to E, at least in my transcription. But it goes through all of the scale degrees in doing so. So it is the challenge of the singer, and it was the challenge for Nishnanova with her excellent technique to be able to do this in a very artful way. But uh, for the tuba player, even though it is beautiful, it presents some challenges. If we take the original arrangement of this piece, the original piece is in C sharp, the piece for orchestra. Now, in the singing register of the F tuba, that is theoretically okay. But I'd like to draw your attention 
wait for it. Here it is. There it is. This section right here. Those eighth notes, those four eighth notes, a G sharp, an A, a B, and a C sharp, if we were actually to transpose that down one octave, which would be the original intention of the tuba player, those notes are so high and so usually uncomfortable, especially after a long buildup in the coda, which is where this part of the score is from, that they're definitely much less than pleasing to hear on the tuba. A much better solution is to take a transcription that is written or that is pitched a third up in E minor rather than C sharp minor and to take that down an additional octave. And what that produces is an arrangement that still includes the very singing register of the F tuba, but it is not so high that it is unplayable or unlistenable to the audience. And believe me when I say this is still, even a hundred years after this piece was written, one of the most beautiful examples of the late romanticism, even if we're not so connected to the singer who sang this or the Russian national spirit that was the motivation behind writing this. At the end of this piece, this will conclude my recital, this argument for the transcription for the tuba. We are musical historians, all of us here, and as tuba players, we have no less a responsibility than any other instrumentalist for keeping the legacy of the great musical masters of the Western world alive. No matter what the means, whether it be a tuba, euphonium, trombone, voice, piano, or violin, we will continue to get the message out. I would like to thank my committee, Drs. Don Schaefer and Dr. Sue Nymore and Professor Gary Ofenlach, my parents who are here from Illinois, and all of you for attending. I hope you very much enjoy Rachmaninoff's vocalise from his 14 romances. One second.